Thursday, October 2nd, 2003. This is the beginning of an interview with Mr. Saul Viner. Mr. Viner is a veteran of World War II. This interview is being conducted at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Frederick Wallace. I am going to be the interviewer. Mr. Viner, as I briefly explained to you, this is your story. We want you to tell it in your own way, but make sure that you take us from the date of your entry into the military services and take us all the way through to the date of your separation and making sure that you touch upon those points that are most important uh, in your mind, the things that you want recorded for history. So Mr. Viner, this is your story. Would you begin, please? I'm a native of a little town in the eastern panhandle of West Virginia, the easternmost county, Jefferson, and the town, Charlestown, two words, not the capital, Charleston, and a small, beautiful town full of history, having been laid out by George Washington's brother, Charles, who built a house still standing, and his brother Samuel built a house immediately west of the city. Uh, the streets were named for George's siblings. The main thoroughfare in Charlestown was Washington Street, and on either side, Independence and Liberty. Having grown up in that environment, history became particularly significant for me. Also, being the child of immigrants from Europe, Lithuania, who had they not come to the United States at the turn of the century. My father in 1899, my mother a year later, I would uh, have been a, either a cinder or a corpse in Eastern Europe. Uh, for that, there was an intense obligation and realization that we were free citizens to become active American citizens and also preserving and carrying out the religious dictates of Judaism. It's a unique community. Uh, the youngest of eight brothers, um, educated in the schools of Charlestown, then Shepherd College, a small town in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, and later the University of West Virginia. Uh, when war came out, or developed, and uh, being closely aligned with and understanding even that tender age of high school, junior, senior, uh, the war took particular significance because my father had family in Lithuania who were decimated. Uh, I know the brother went into the Naval Reserve and was already quickly posted to COM-8 in New Orleans. I was told by friends in our little town that I registered for the draft early in the spring of 42, um, soon after my 21st birthday, and uh, that my number was, even if it weren't to, supposed to tell me the chance that my number would come up in the draft. So my parents agreed that it might be a good idea to do as my brother Jacob had done, uh, to try for a naval commission. And I was fortunate <coughs> in being so selected. Uh, and my orders were to report to Cornell University August 1st uh, for a two-month stint in the School of Communications. Uh, so off I went. Uh, really uh, from a sheltered childhood, as you may get into this entirely new experience uh, with considerable trepidation. My parents and a much older brother drove me up to Ithaca, New York, where my brother had gotten in touch with some, a lovely family through business connections who gave me a, 
an anchor, as it were, in a place I could go on the brief weekend uh, leave whenever possible. Uh, my parents went back to West Virginia. I meanwhile at some point contracted some, uh, well I think it was the, the food, uh, not having time to go to the bathroom, uh, some sort of problem and I wound up in the sick bay as we termed it, even though it was the hospital connected with Cornell. But that took care of itself. And then near the end of our two month period, uh, we were advised that we were going to be sent to Harvard to, the, to a larger uh, school of communications to better prepare ourselves for the day. Uh, I recall we went by train, rail from Ithaca to Boston. And I'll take on my Boston accent. It took all day. It was quite an experience and I, I'm trying to remember, I think they fed us at one point. Uh, at Cornell we'd eaten in the, uh, it was called the Navy Mess, but it was the big dining hall at, uh, uh, Woman Street Hall was at it anyway. And the food was so, so. And I must make this personalized. Until that point, I'd been raised in a rather observant home and had not eaten any of the forbidden foods or anything that was in kosher. But this was also an experience. Multi, many threads, let me put it that way. And it was rugged. These people in it a lovely family. And it was the high holy days, and it's appropriate this week between Rosh Hashanah, the New Year, and David Talmud this weekend, you know, that I, uh, there were other Jews, uh, some few that I'd gotten to know, uh, asked for time off to go to services. Well, begrudgingly, I uh, was given a couple of hours to go to the evening service, and the next morning, just a couple of hours to go by bus. After all these years, I can understand it, but uh, it was less than, uh, shall we say, as considerate as it would have hoped, or I realized as time went on that other commanding officers did things differently. And it wasn't life and death at that point. But after all these years, Part of the story. Then we went to Harvard, and uh, being on the campus at Cambridge was a, a, a broadening experience too, and uh, a plus. Uh, even though we were in classes and training most of the day, we did get a feeling of the academic and university atmosphere there. Though the students were, the enrollment was, a, was gradually. Uh, decreasing because many were going into the service. Uh, and then that did not go the full four months. And in mid, even after Thanksgiving, because of the high casualties and the loss of naval ships and personnel in the South Pacific, the Southwest Pacific, uh, members of my class were being dis discharged and sent to remote parts, well, wherever the Navy needed them. Uh, Can I stop you there for a minute? Yes. Uh, the training that you received at Harvard yes. and at Yale? No, at Cornell. At Cornell at and Harvard. That seems to be unusual. All, all Navy personnel don't get this kind of training. But well, we were in well, communications. So you went to Harvard, Cornell, and Harvard for furtherance of your communications qualifications? Yes. In other words, when I got my commission and the Navy wanted, selected me to go to, in the School of Communications and be in, uh, to be in performing communication duties until such time it may change. So I was training for that. He learned about Navy procedures, history, learn to uh, type, 
uh, you also learn to semaphore, uh, also uh, my terminology fails me. Uh, Morse code? Morse code, thank you, you're terrific. Uh, all those things related to communications. That we, on the uh, tennis courts, by this time it's well to November, and awful cold on the, on the tennis courts at Harvard, we learned semaphore as well. And all of that, in addition to logistics, uh, charting, distances, uh, and if we were, uh, and thank God I wasn't assigned to running a ship, but also there was the possibility of land-based operations, which yeah. we hoped for, but not known what future would help. And that was uh, uh, December 16, 1942, that I was called out of class as for I don't know, half a dozen of us, and that we were getting our orders, going different places. Uh, and uh, I remember the date, because uh, when I telephoned my parents, uh, and then one of my brothers called, who lived in Richmond, that they had had a daughter the night on the 16th of December. So I, had, I was fortunate, because living uh, in Charleston, which was near Washington, I could take the train to Washington. My father met me, because we had a branch of our business in Washington. And uh, I was able to come home to Charlestown for about uh, five days, which was unique. And then we went to Norfolk, where I was to embark on a ship for base left, where base left was. I didn't know, nobody else did, and in a minute I'll tell you. But we went to Norfolk, uh, it was Christmas Day. We went on the Friday, it was a Saturday, my parents took, and again with friends that we had in Norfolk, spent the uh, night with them. And my oldest brother in this case took me out to the base and uh, well, as I wrote in a, a little story of my life, uh, which appeared in the Journal of the Jefferson County Historical Society in Charleston, I couldn't look back. So we went out to the base and I reported in. It was a cold, blustery day and uh, went through all the procedures of checking in and somebody took me aboard the USS Hermitage. Now the USS Hermitage had been a, a, a luxury liner, but it had taken part in the invasion of North Africa some few months before, and it was sent back to Norfolk, to Hampton Roads uh, Naval Base, to carry us to base left, which turned out to be Brisbane, Australia. Uh, and we left the day after Christmas, and it was cold and uh, not having ever been on a, any kind of ship. Uh, it was uh, rough going because the ship would go down and then come up and go down, and, and as we proceeded down the east coast of our blessed United States. And it got warmer, of course, as we came in. And we were to go to the Panama Canal, uh, which was going to be an exciting experience. Aboard ship, we were casual or uh, officers, personnel. This was a troop ship that carried, I don't recall, but maybe six or 7,000 servicemen going up to the Southwest Pacific. But as naval officers, we were had some training in the communications with the uh, staff of the ship itself. Even met the captain, and in those days, uh, the captain was like Lord Almighty. But there were different kinds of officers. I mean by that, some resented us, 
looking over the shoulder or having a drink. But one chap couldn't have been nice. Two of us. And when we arrived near the at, at Panama, uh, I had the duty uh, from four in the morning to eight. And uh, he was very kind. He said, why don't you go down and bring the pilot aboard? He's waiting to come aboard to guide us through the canal. I must tell you, that was, you know, I was still a greedy, but it was exciting. And I brought him aboard and brought him all the way up to the cabin where the, he would take over and guide the ship. And that day was spent uh, going through the canal, uh, which took all day, but it was uh, a memorable experience. And when we got to the other side of the canal, it was night, we spent the night there, and then headed, still not knowing where we were going, across the Pacific in convoy. And I forget how many uh, ships were involved, but we were the main one troop carrier. There were a couple of small ones and destroyers, cruisers, and all of that. And uh, that was uh, New Year's weekend. And we went see day after day across the Pacific, uh, two meals a day, um, occasionally a little orange juice, and I never have never been a coffee drinker, and there was no chance of getting tea. So, but there was a library, and you could read, and just talk and talk and talk. Uh, after three going on four weeks, we approached uh, Noumea, uh, and uh, it, the ship dropped anchor there in the harbor. Uh, it's in New Caledonia, or the Navy's called New Bell Caledonia, uh, and several members of our staff had the good fortune, much to the envy of us common people, to go ashore for registered publications or whatever. And uh, they were the envy of everybody. But we were there a couple of days, and I must tell you, there's no, I can visualize to this day the vast number of naval ships, not only the U.S., but from other countries in this endless expanse, this tremendous harbor. Well, we left there on a, I think it was a Thursday night, and then as we approached Australia, we were told we were going to Brisbane, Australia, and on the last day of January, we pulled into Morton Bay, and if you're familiar with the map of Australia, uh, this is the northeast corner, and there's this tremendous bay, uh, and into which empties the Brisbane River. So we came into Morton Bay and headed up to Brisbane. In January 31st, down under, it's the middle of summer. I left out one thing. When we crossed the date line, or rather the equator, they had the the rough going, a lot of fun, part of my hair was shaved, but it was something, it was fun ultimately, and exciting. Uh, and I also knew it was pretty far from West Virginia. Anyway, we arrived there and came up, and up the bay, and on the shoreline, the most extraordinary flowers, uh, uh, the jacaranda tree, which is mowed, uh, hibiscus everywhere, gigantic size, all sorts of things in bloom. And when we pulled into the, actually the dock where we were going to be at Hamilton, it's a part of, uh, of Brisbane, which is really a huge city uh, geographically. It was something like the fifth largest city in the world at that point, as far as territory. And uh, someone, we disembarked, 
and someone spotted across the road a milk bar. Well, the five or six of us ran across the road and had fabulous milkshake and some ice cream. Uh, then we were transported out. There was no permanent lodging for us. We were carried out to Camp Doomden, which is an Aboriginal name, uh, where there was a big army in Canada. And so for the first almost week, we were housed in a tent, and I think six of us in a tent. And it was, again, not luxury living, but so far so. And the weather was gorgeous. And the first night uh, that we were there, uh, I drew, again, uh, security duty, guarding the pu registered publications. I was equipped with a firearm, and to this day, they can't help me if anybody had showed up to try to be. But the Army military was a real thing. And I went through the telephone directory looking for a synagogue. I uh, couldn't find one listed, and later I found out why they didn't have a telephone. Uh, but this was Australia, Brisbane, Australia, on the northern frontier, really. And uh, during that week, we had no particular duties, so we were able to take the tram and go into the city. Uh, Camp Duman would be, how shall I describe it, maybe in one of the uh, remote counties of the, the greater Atlanta area, say being out at Emory, the Emory area, and taking a tram to go out Route 41 towards Cobb County, but maybe a little more distant. And, uh, but we went to the city and found it very interesting. It was a holiday, a favorite holiday there. It was for Australians. And we took the tram, and it was quite a broadening experience, converting some money. And uh, we had a restaurant that food was marvelous. Um, and one of my, a man with whom I became very friendly, had been with um, um, a radio station in Washington. He was considerably older, he had been a newspaper man. We had become very friendly, very interesting guy, a very nice guy, uh, a Catholic. And he, uh, and I mentioned to him, I was looking for a synagogue. Meanwhile, he located where the cathedral was and all of that. And on a Friday, uh, Cash, his name was Cassius Marcellus Keller, Cash, said, so look, here's an account of the newspaper, which was the Brisbane Courier Mail, pronounced Courier Mile in Australia, uh, about a wedding. And here's the name of the rabbi. Um, and where the, it was held the families. And uh, so I went to the telephone directory being Friday, uh, open telephone there, and found the name, W-O-L-M-A-N, and the telephone to ask what time service would be. And a, a lady with a very pleasant voice, young lady, said that at six o'clock before the blackout, and uh, uh, and she said, well, you're welcome to come home after services. And having been instructed by my mother that you refused the first invitation, I said, oh, thank you. That's how I wouldn't want to caution your father. And she said, well, oh, suit yourself. Uh, and uh, when I hung up, I realized I didn't know where it was located and how I got there. So I called back again, and I you know, reintroduced myself, and uh, she told me what tram to take and where the thing I was actually located, and uh, said something along the lines, you know, meant as a serviceman come and come to our home and talk about it. I said, oh, thank you very much. Well, I got. And it was a security, I think I had to make two trams and whatever. Um, and uh, I did go to synagogue, the service had already started, and then a beautiful voice was intoning the service. 
uh, in traditional synagogues is the service is mainly in Hebrew and a great deal of is chanted. And there were a lot of servicemen, American, Australian, whatever, in, in the synagogue. And uh, at the conclusion of services, and this happened every Friday evening, there were seven or eight families that collected the servicemen and took them to their homes. Well, uh, the rabbi, as, as the story goes on, I'll tell you how I got to know him very well, brought those home. They lived in synagogue. His, the rabbi's residence was about a block away. Uh, those many families, well intentioned, took the officers and some of them. But he collected the writers that day. And there was a pretty young lady there, teenager, who uh, somehow got caught up in the rabbi's group, fortunately. We walked over and um, and there was this perfectly beautiful table, finest china, silver. And that same ship that I was on, but there was another, I brought in a number of chapters, Jewish and otherwise. And they had contacted uh, Rabbi Baldwin. And they were at the table, and all sorts of others, some that had been there months and came directly on Friday night. And uh, the family prepared everything. There were no servants to be had in Australia during the war. Uh, not that there were that many before the war. Uh, and I was so taken, the rabbi's wife, perfectly lovely, charming lady, and they had three daughters. To move the story forward, I married. Oh, the story that I wanted to talk to him. Oh, uh, but I was stationed in Brisbane to be there permanently. Well, my mother-in-law always said, Friday, I know you boys have to work tomorrow on Saturday, but if anybody's free, please come serve us. Didn't you go, come here and have lunch? Well, little did she know she had to take her in it. So I came back to me. And it was really just a wonderful experience. Uh, and uh, the next day, we were to be transferred from army camp into a hotel, which had been taken over by the Navy, um, Embassy Hotel. Uh, in Australia, many of the hotels, small ones, were really uh, hotels, yes, but the main floor was given over to a pub, a bar. Uh, but we were very comfortable, and on uh, Saturday when I left, uh, before I left, I tried to take the girls somewhere to the movie, but then learned that during wartime, and it was also the, uh, how things were, you booked your seats for the movies their way as you would do for a play or whatever. And by Saturday late afternoon, it was too late to. So I said, said I'd come by on Sunday, maybe before well, the movies were closed. But I came by Sunday afternoon late. And having been, having eaten at the hotel, and I knew how to get there by tram, wasn't difficult. Uh, and with a box of chocolate. Well, had a lot of fun. And we, uh, Brisbane is on the river, and parts of, and the river winds like a big S through the city. And there was a wonderful little boat that took people from the end of the street where the Walmans lived to Kangaroo Point. And you went for tuppence or something like that. And there was a way to ride, so we did and came back. Well, as time went on, uh, and then we had regular duties, working hours, ships, and all that. Um, I came back with some frequency and got to know some more. And uh, that was uh, early January. And 
prison became a transfer point for some of the people that were unfortunate. Uh, some went to the islands. Uh, one chap, and we became friendly, was a man behind the lines in some of the islands with the Japanese were operating. And they were, uh, I can't remember the term. Anyway, they, they were spies, as you might say, and their lives were at risk. And they would come back every now and again, because two in particular spoke Japanese. They had lived in Japan before the war. Uh, and each time they came back, they were thinner and thinner. And it was really rough going. So, and then some of the American naval personnel, officers, were put on a few Australian warships as, uh, uh, again, my terminology fails me, but they were Americans helping the Australians with communication. And my roommate was a chap from Seattle, and uh, he was on one of the ships as well. And the ship was a bomb torpedoed by the Japanese, and he was lost. Uh, we were in prison, it was described as a garrison town because it was the northern frontier. The Japanese uh, had bombed Darwin, which again, looking at the map of Australia, was the middle part of the northern part of Australia. Uh, and then uh, a submarine had been spotted in the Sydney Harbor. And Sydney was uh, a great distance south of Brisbane. Brisbane again, and in the capital state of Queensland, which is the big, again, repeating the big northeastern corner of Australia. And so uh, there were American military personnel and Dutch who had, who had escaped uh, from Java, uh, any number, and a lot of British, but mainly Americans, and a vast number of Australians. Uh, I was fortunate that I was permanently stationed there with the staff of the Admiral, Admiral Barbie, commander of the Southwest Pacific Amphibious Force, which became the seventh because the Southwest Pacific Navy, Naval Forces was the, the seventh fleet. And I forget what the numbers applied to the Mediterranean and the Atlantic and so forth. Uh, so, I had regular duties, sometimes working at night, and having to do primarily with, uh, we got a lot of, most of our messages from uh, the 7th Fleet Command, which was two blocks away in another building. And that was also MacArthur's headquarters, so we used to see General MacArthur with great frequency. And if we have to be at the AMP building or going for whatever uh, naval uh, information or whatever to carry back to our offices, you'd see a big limousine roll up, everybody standing to attention, crowds in the street, and General MacArthur, who was not the most popular man, getting out like uh, he would be member of a royal family or something. Um, he brought his wife and little boy out of the Philippines to Brisbane. And uh, the nurse made Chinese. He had lots of furniture, but he left a lot of people behind. And you know that story of the privations and the, the harm done to those. Americans who were left in the Philippines. Uh, there were nurses and military who had served in the Philippines at some time, who had gotten out earlier or come back to, who had gotten to know them as well. Uh, so I stayed in prison.
carrying out my duties, decoding messages, and also when amphibious equipment, ships, personnel came out, they reported to us, and we assisted them in uh, uh, providing information, materials, uh, and helping them on their way. Many went north to uh, another part of Australia, some went to the islands, uh, and that was my life in Australia from early 43 for uh, continuing for another year or so. Meanwhile, a romance developed and uh, over Jackie's parents' objections, we became engaged. Uh, but there were restrictions against serv American servicemen marrying Australian women. My father-in-law, who was also a chaplain in the Australian Imperial Forces, uh, um, said, let's call on the senior Navy chaplain what's going on, even though my father was not interested or encouraging, but we went and uh, the chaplain said, all right, and uh, then we could get married. So a week later, we were married in the synagogue in Brisbane, Australia. One sister had entered the army and was in Victoria, went able to come home. That was a whole other story. But anyway, all those months in Australia were an extraordinary experience. Getting married, getting to know the country. I had an opportunity to travel to Sydney, to Melbourne, and back. And it's tied me to that country to this day. Uh, came back, got orders to come back. Uh, let me ask you a question here, please. All right. Uh, while in Australia, were you subjected to any hostile fire of any kind? No. There were no I Japanese was, attacks? We were very much protected and safe. Now, at that time, there were concerns because children were evacuated, not knowing what the Japanese were going to do, into uh, uh, places in the interior of Queensland, but no hostile fire. So we knew about things again in Northern Australia. Uh, the personnel officer in the 7th Fleet would, would have been awfully nice to a lot of us younger women, Navy men. I returned to Washington uh, some months, I guess we'd been there less than a year. And he carried back a message for me and I wrote to an older brother uh, in Washington and they became friendly. And uh, meanwhile my mother uh, became very, very ill. And I'd already been out there over a year. Uh, and uh, they were going to release me to come back to the States, but the orders never came through. Cheryl went and met with it and told Commander Lampy about it, and my orders materialized all of a sudden uh, to come back to the States uh, to ultimately go Naval Air Station, Santa Fly, as communications officer. But uh, went back on the Lur Line, which is the troop ship, on a company, not in Congress to San Francisco. Even though I had the orders to go, and when I got to San Francisco to report to the Navy, and my details of where I was going uh, would be provided and so forth, and an opportunity to go home as well. Uh, 
but the, the orders never came through about going to San Francisco. So we were stuck in San Francisco for about two weeks. And the orders finally came through after many phone calls, and I, we could go home to Charlestown and then to Vaughan. And was your wife with you at the time? Yes, and that was a whole experience of leaving her folks. Uh, and uh, coming to the States. And actually, my wife had a, any number of American relatives. In time, having met them, my mother-in-law came in many trips. And, and, uh, uh, so that was, a, in retrospect, a horrendous experience. Very much, very different. Even though my family was welcoming, but really coming from another culture. My wife, was born in Manchester, England, as was her mother. My father was in London there. And she grew up in Cork, where he had been the rabbi. And from Cork, they'd gone to Australia at the urging of the chief rabbi to get the young clergy to go out to the colonies. And over their families protest, they go for three years. Well, the war broke out, and they stayed. And he became a chaplain in the army, in addition to serving uh, his community. And the rabbis in the high principal Australian cities all became chaplains. Uh, so we came, went to Florida. Uh, I went ahead and Jackie uh, went to visit a great aunt in New York, her grandmother's sister, and then came to Florida. And by this time she was pregnant. And uh, I had been able to get a little apartment in Sanford, which was a naval air station. There was an army base nearby, and the usual story. And then I took over, over the objections of the outgoing communications officer who didn't want to leave. And finally, the commanding officer of the base said to him, after two weeks of this, you have to go. And the last day, I can see this now, he opens up his desk drawer, and there are all sorts of reports that were never completed. And he was a little Napoleon, as he said. He was, and all this was not. But fortunately, there were some naval personnel on the bar, but civilians from the area who couldn't have been more helpful to me. And uh, that was uh, a very nice period there at Sanford. And, uh, then uh, went down there in uh, late, well, we came back, whatever, but I think it went down there late August or something like that. And uh, a year passed, and the war was coming to an end, and it had orders, you know, to be discharged, which was already into November, and I'd be still on subject recall, but I could come to a civilian again. And uh, that was not easy either. Now married, a daughter who was born in Orlando, who lives here in Atlanta. Uh, and uh, readjusted and wanted to go back to school. I'd earned a bachelor's degree before going into the Navy. This was from 42, from Shepherd College in Jefferson County, an old, old college, teacher's college, because I wanted to teach. Uh, anyway, it all worked itself out. I was accepted for a graduate program at the University of West Virginia, Morgan Down. And met Jackie and Elaine are drawn in Charlestown, but then I found a place to live in Morgan Down for part of the time that we lived there. Multiple area, a master of arts degree in American history. Uh, and wanted to teach, but my father and mother thought of that. Was, what kind of a life is that going to be as a teacher? Wife, a daughter, how did you go to the family business? 
But that's about the story, not having to do with the war, but certainly the challenges, the problems, the emotions, the complexities of having been at the service, having been really a youngster, really, even though I was 21 when I graduated from college, that I was inexperienced and to, uh, being protected and taken care of by the Navy, earning a livelihood, all of that, to be confronted with the readjustment here at the let me take you back to your military experience. Uh, from what you have been relating, your experience was quite a bit different from others who were in the military during World War II. Yes. How did you feel about that? Well, in all candor and with reflection, very lucky, very fortunate, knowing as a case of my roommate who died in the sea uh, off the coast of Australia, having been torpedoed. And periodically, some of those who might know uh, would go to other posts, Southwest Pacific or elsewhere in the world, and uh, having and keeping in touch with some of these people. When, or, there were you know, a little, shall we say, group of us who had been at Cornell and Harvard that we would hear from others and finding out this one had died, that one had died. And even from my hometown, uh, a neighbor across the street with whom we'd been very close, uh, one of the first to die in Europe from Charlestown. But out there, yes, knowing full well, I was very far from home. But I was very fortunate. I got to know people in Brisbane, and you know, it was a great experience. I was very fortunate and grateful. What was your most memorable experience uh, of your tour of duty in the military? Well. I think in Australia it was uh, suddenly become becoming very much aware of the the threat of the Japanese and that we went for rifle training, even though we were Navy and all that and desk job oriented. But we, and where we went for the it was at an army installation. Um, I think it was a prisoner of war camp, and we saw a bush Japanese. And it was unsettling, pretty much, to see the enemy so close at hand, but behind barbed wire. Um, I think some of the, and the reports would come back, and the coast watchers, if the word I want, those who went behind the lines of the army. And one man, a particularly close friend of mine, who became best man in our wedding, who had lived in Japan for many years, his family had been in the international trade, uh, but they were selling Japanese high quality portion of it in his wholesalers in New York. Uh, and uh, just knowing one way or another what went on and the first American soldier died in Australia was Jewish. And my father-in-law, although it was my father-in-law that uh, went to conduct services at some remote army facility way up in order to bring it back. Uh, all these things became somewhat grim and real. I think you refer to these people uh, who were behind the Japanese line as coast watchers. Yes, if you read the novels of uh, I'm drawing a blank. Um, you know, the oh, South Pacific, 
Mm -hmm. You know, it's based on a series of stories by that uh, wonderful writer. Yeah, I can't he, think of his name. Yeah, either. and the real stories have to do with the Coast Watchers, and you know, the male lead in uh, South Pacific was the name Debec or whatever, mm -hmm. and at the request of the American Navy to, to go into the islands where he knew some of the natives and all. And as a coast watcher, and, and they would report back the radio, and periodically, when the scheduled dates, these men would disappear, but that they were hidden or in the, in the, shall we say, the forest, the jungle, whatever. And so that, that's and a submarine would come pick them up, mm -hmm. and, they them, and they'd be brought back to prison to report and on the jail for what they saw the activity in the book, some of which was reported by radio. And they really took their lives in their hands. Mm -hmm. Most of them came back, some didn't. Then I think, and looking back about 60 years, uh, I think they would be the militarily speaking. And then uh, also located in Brisbane was the service force for the seventh fleet. So all these entities, in one way or another, we learned a great deal about the war. Mm -hmm. Good. Great deal Now in Florida, uh, there was a case of preparing young men to go overseas to fly be engaged in combat. It's a different perspective. Uh, but again, I was very fortunate to be part of a, partly a civilian life while serving in the Navy. And they're one of the memorable things. was a hurricane. And recently a hurricane Isabel and struck my hometown of Richmond. Mm -hmm. Devastation. Absolutely. We've been talking to our friends and they've called it unbelievable what has happened there. Some are still without power and water. Uh, but there was one in, uh, in uh, San Bernardino. I was communications officer and uh, one of my key uh, civilians, or rather a Navy men, came and got me at the height of this one across the base because I was needed, not that I really needed, but decisions to be made. And I left Jackie at home uh, with her baby daughter and across the street were friends of ours. He was a Navy pilot. He had to go out to the base. It was a Naval Air Station. And leaving his wife and baby, and afterwards we realized that, you know, that, but we survived. Uh, so we've got about five more minutes, so in summation, how I would you say, sum it up? Uh, I was proud to have served, uh, having once uh, been made a civilian. I really didn't want any part of it anymore. However, my perspective changed in time that I had fought, literally, if I may use that phrase. I'd served on behalf of my country. And one must look at what's going on today. And this may not be part of what you want. And we hear from Washington all sorts of things about comparing it to World War II. No way. No way, and I think it's an offense to those who serve in World War II. I'm highly subjective on the matter about all those hundreds of American men who died over there. It's uh, something which is a matter of great concern and sadness. But I'm, at the age of 82, grateful for the freedom I've had and something I've been going back to early on. 
I had my parents remained in Europe. No way. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate you relating your uh, experiences with us. And uh, this information will be archived uh, at the um, Library of Congress. And I thank you for the opportunity and your courtesies and your professionalism as a volunteer. Thank you. You're welcome. Well.